I'm Warren Clef, and this is the Dealmaker Podcast. I'm here with Yaniv Sarig. From, he's the CEO of Mohawk Group. And Mohawk Group is very interesting. And one thing that attracted me to many things attracted me to this, but in talking to Yaniv, they're building technology, but not necessarily for you and Joe Bag of Donuts, middle of America company guy to use. It's not accounting software or SaaS software that is exclusively used by customers, they're using it themselves. And that's interesting to me because it raises the stakes enormously. You know, you're building the plane as you're flying it. What the platform does and why you're building it. Sure. Thanks, first of all, for having me. I'm excited to be here and, and tell our story. Uh, you know, the story goes back uh, just a little over six years ago. Uh, with the other founders, we all come from a software technology background. And uh, through a set of events, we got really, um, you know, curious about e-commerce. And one of the one of the things that really caught our attention was that a lot of the traditional consumer brands that have, you know, created the products that we consume in the last, say, I don't know, 40, 50 years in, in, in traditional brick and mortar retail, you know, we realized that they were very inequipped to be to to be successful in e-commerce. Just their entire approach to the cycles of retail and the speed at which they were moving, how data-driven they were, just didn't meet the needs of consumers of today. And, and so we really, the, the spark that started this company was this idea of like, how do we build the consumer company of the future? We wanted to build a, a consumer product company that was designed from the ground up uh, to be a leading company in the e-commerce platforms that we shop in today, the Amazon, et cetera. And, and, and really, one of the most fundamental realization was that technology was going to be a key, key important factor in this, the, the success of such a futuristic consumer platform, right? And so what we've done with Mohawk is we built a hybrid of a technology company and a consumer company. So what that means is our business is to sell consumer products to the end consumers. We actually have built on our own uh, five different brands. We recently acquired under seven brands, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So we managed 12 different consumer brands that we own, but instead of doing everything by hand, instead of having to constantly manage all the forecasting and all the media buying and figuring out what's the next product we need to make, all these different challenges that a consumer company would have to do if they didn't have technology, we went and built uh, you know, an in my opinion, a very, very powerful technology platform that allows us to just build consumer product brands and products in a more efficient way. And okay. so in a nutshell, what that platform does is it gathers a lot of data what consumers want and tells us what products to make and it automates all the day-to-day -day management of these products. Okay. The, let me tell you what I heard. Uh, economics and civil society, as we know it, has just ended because... <laughs> You don't need entrepreneurs. You don't need economists. You don't need marketing companies. You just have Mohawk come in, scrub the data, and decide <laughs> what society needs, right? And now you don't need an entrepreneur because he goes and builds it, packages it together, prices it, and so, matter of fact, like, uh, you know, the last seven Nobel Prize winners in economics are going to watch this interview and then go turn in their Nobel Prize. <laughs> well, you gave this to me erroneously. I, well, I it, this that, doesn't apply anymore. There's no such thing as economics. It's just your need. I, I uh, wow, you swing the pendulum pretty far here, right? I, I uh, <laughs> first of all, I'm glad I'm glad you think so highly of me just in a few minutes. But uh, that's not exactly what we're saying. What what we're saying is is more along the lines of to be uh, a good consumer company in today's world, you have to understand the customer, predict what they want, bring that product to market fast enough and be able to manage marketing at a very high level at a high scale. Now, let's let's unpack what I said in a sec for a Wait. second. Let's let's start first of all with understanding the customer. That's extremely let me, important. Let me interrupt for a second. Yeah. Just put it in context. Sure. Right. I know what you're thinking, Orin, if I could finish my sentence, this would be a better interview. You know, you don't know, hey Orin, you don't know anything about this, but you seem to be doing a lot of talking. But <laughs> I, I just want to put it in context. <laughs> okay. Um so if you think about Amazon what Amazon has been doing, you know, they, they've been making these sort of micro brands in mm -hmm. consumer products, beef yeah. jerky, uh, socks, baseball hats. And, you know, there was an expose, I think, in the New York Times. Did you see it? You must have because it's your business where they they found on Fiverr employees of Amazon, right, making 
logos for these sub brands with cowboy boots, I think was the example. So mm -hmm. Amazon is getting cowboy boots from, oh, I don't know, China, right? Where, you know, cowboy boots are very uh, made, I guess, and uh, making a very Texas looking brand on fiber and then popping up a uh, aesthetically pleasing American, you know, photograph of American models wearing cowboy boots with the cool lasso brand and they have a pop-up shop. And then they've been doing this, you know, 280 other times since beef jerky and socks and baseball hats and jeans and everything like that. How, how does this put this in context for what is this and where are you in relation yeah. to this? Well, it's a great example. What you just described is a great example. This business you're talking about is, to my knowledge, approximately like two, three billion dollars of revenue for Amazon, their private label business. And yeah. here's the question back to you. Do you know the name of any of these micro brands that they're building? No, none. That's really what you should focus on. And that's really the power of what I'm speaking about, right? The reason you don't know it, right? There's approximately 280 micro brands that Amazon has created scattered through their website that, as I said, generate, I think, two to $3 billion in revenue to my knowledge, right? Uh, and the powerful thing behind that play is that what they are doing is very similar to what we're talking about, which is they're looking at the data, they're looking at how consumers are shopping, and they're building the products to meet that demand, not around the brand, but around the data-driven demand that consumers have. This is the most important thing to take out of this interview probably, right? The reason Mohawk exists and the reason Amazon is doing what they're doing on the private label uh, business is because consumers have been empowered by e-commerce to use data over brand. What I mean by that, this is the best example to explain it. If you go back 30, 40 years ago, before we had Amazon in our, or Google in our pocket, before we had these engines of due diligence in our pocket, well, we went to a store and you looked at a product you wanted to buy. You had a shelf that was very limited, maybe 10 different choices. And the choices were the brands you saw on TV. And you had no data. You didn't have reviews. You couldn't do price and feature comparison. You had absolutely no way to know, except that you kind of like were programmed to say that, hey, Samsung, that means this value, this price. Sony means this value, this price. And that was just kind of like the power of the brand was to make you believe that. Whether that was true or not, you just had no data. What's amazing with e-commerce is you fast forward to today and you look at how consumers shop, think at Amazon, for example, 75% of all product searches on Amazon don't have a brand in them. What that tells you is consumers are feeling empowered by this technology. And instead of looking for, you know, say they need an air purifier, right? Because they think that they need to breathe better air, right? So they're not gonna say, I need an air purifier from Black & Decker or from some other brand they know. They're gonna say best air purifier for small rooms, best air purifier for uh, pets, right? And a million other questions that just come from their mind as to what solutions to a problem they're looking to build to buy. And then what they're going to do is they're going to look at the data. They're going to look at the ratings. They're going to look at the products. They're going to look at the features. And they're going to make decisions based on data. What Mohawk does, and in a sense what Amazon does as well, is we reverse that data. We ingest a terabyte of data every day around information that's publicly available or provided by APIs of the different partners that we use that tells us what consumers are searching for, what do they like and don't like about the products that are out there? And how can we, in this massive market, find opportunities to make something better for those customers? That's okay. really the core kind of essential piece of the existence of, of this company is this consumer-centric approach and data-driven approach to making products. All right. Let me unpack a couple things here. I looked at your resume and your background in Mohawk. And I said, oh my God, I got to do a 10 minute interview here. Let me see how fast, but now I want to do a three hour <laughs> interview. Um, we run out of tape. I have a million questions. I want to unpack. So you know what this reminds me of? Uh, I can't give you the name of the brand, uh, but uh, there, by the way, do you do any uh, sports like triathlete or tri or what, what sports are you into? I, I used to, I'm, I'm just too consumed by this entrepreneurial yeah. journey at this point, which I, I should probably uh, do more of it, but no, I, I, so, I mean, I, yeah. So there's a, there's in, in, um, triathlon, there's a couple bike brands, mm -hmm. right? Trek and Trevello and, yeah. um, uh, Pinarello. And so, um, I met a guy uh, who's a dad of one of my son, my, I have a seven year old son and he plays hockey and the mm -hmm. dad started talking to him and he runs one of the companies that makes one of the best known household name triathlon bikes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, the company, it's a multinational company. They brought me in as the CEO. Uh, I'm in charge of the brand. I moved it out of, you know, it was off in the hinterland because it was cheap, 
call it, you know, North Carolina or whatever, manufacturing cheap, industrial park was cheap. I moved to Southern California where the brand should be. Mm -hmm. I go, oh, that's amazing. You know, what do you ride? What are your times? You know, what are your routes? What do you? He goes, I fucking hate bicycles. <laughs> I said, sorry, I, just, I couldn't hear you over the hockey. I thought you said I fucking hate bicycles. He goes, mm -hmm. yeah, I fucking hate bicycles. I don't own a bike. I don't ride a bike. I'm not interested. Matter of fact, I don't really like triathletes. <laughs> you guys, wait, isn't that your only customer? Like you're a triathlon, but yeah. Goes, yeah, I, I hate triathletes. They're pansy, picky, you know, self-indulgent, Newport Beach athletes. Anyway, I don't want to get, now there's enough to figure out. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's, complete they brought him in to run an established well-known top of the food chain brand because he is a hundred percent data-driven and unemotional about the sport that's why he's there yeah i think because uh you know of these elements that you're talking about in mohawk so within the brands that you have what can you give us a couple examples of one that you really love uh and one that you hate <laughs> or love to hate <clears throat> You know, I, I, this is a great, it, you, you actually touched on a really important point, right? I love our business in general, but you're right. We're taking also a very mathematical approach, right? At the end of the day, if you sell a product online, there, you, can, you can represent that entire business with a math equation, right? There is a bunch of, uh, there's a certain, uh, you know, uh, parameters around the cost of the product. How many people are going to look for it? How many people are going to click on your product? How many people are going to buy it? What's going to be the cost of shipping? You can literally represent a product's life in e-commerce through a mathematical function and now the question is is this a good one is this a good business is this mathematical function a good business or not now whether the underlying product is a hair dryer a fridge uh, a makeup brush that matters less what matters is can you identify the most interesting equations that are unsolved in this incredibly gigantic market out there predict the equations that are going to matter the most and actually go and execute on them in a very meaningful way, right? So to, to that extent, I mean, to get an example, right? I mean, if tomorrow our data showed us that, I don't know, ukuleles uh, for, uh, you know, uh, middle school kids uh, it, uh, that are this and this color are a $5 million business with a 20% margin that no one's like capitalizing on, guess what? We're gonna launch a brand that's gonna be exactly tailored for that. And within five to six months, we're gonna have a product ready to present to consumers who are looking for that because we saw in the data that they couldn't find that exact thing out there. I just came up with that out of my mind, right? But that's how we think about it. As opposed to traditional brands that are going to say, well, I'm a kitchen brand, so I have to have everything in my portfolio from a spoon to like uh, a mixer. To... We don't think like that. We think at the product level, laser focused on what the data showed us with very granular demand analysis, right? And, and we're only gonna make a product if we believe that mathematically, we're gonna be able to take significant market share that's gonna be worth our time. Does that make sense? Yeah, a million percent. Uh, so I've heard this story, you know, a couple different times from people attacking it from different directions. The issue is execution. Yeah. So I think it's been the dream of, you know, different people in different space, because they see what Amazon has done. And sure. say, hey, leave the computer overnight in in AI mode, right? See what it can come up with. But but the execution of it is what. So what does it cost once you've identified? What can a segment? What does it cost to pop up a brand in a five million dollars segment? Right. So you know the way we think about launching our products is is we first we gather the data, we identify there's an opportunity, we do an analysis that's purely theoretical with some estimates that our engine spits in terms of like how much marketing you're gonna need and all that. And if the PNL looks good, the next phase is we go and find the contract manufacturer that can actually make this product, right? We work, we have a team of almost 40 people today. Uh, that can connect with pretty much any contract manufacturer around the world and, and kind of work with them on the perfect spec that we're trying to achieve. And, and then obviously we crunch the numbers again, <clears throat> we run through quality control, and then we select the right manufacturer to go make the product. As I said, six to, six to eight months is what it takes us if the product is a hard good from Asia, typically manufactured in Asia. That's how much it takes to get it to, to, to market. And then from there, again, there's that laser focus on the marketing. We're not just trying to say to everyone, hey, our brand, you wouldn't, you know, we, we're doing north of 300 million of revenue this year. That's how the reason we got in the market at. Yet you wouldn't recognize any one of our brands because if you search for very particular yeah. things, you might see our product as one of the best options. But our marketing is exactly that, where we saw the opportunity, where we saw that people were searching for something that they meant, 
that's where they're going to see our product. We're going to show up there in ads. We might show up there organically in the search. And, and we're going to put all our, all our focus on the marketing there. And the ROI that we're expecting is typically today, when we launch a product for the first three months, we are super investing in marketing to introduce the product. Three months later, we stop that super investment. And so first three months, we super invest. Then we turn the product profitable at a unit economic level, which means that after six months, we recoup the entire cost of launching that product. And if we're successful, hopefully that product has many years of positive cash flow generation going forward, right? So it's a very rapid cycle of re, uh, you know, recouping back your initial investment. And the beautiful thing about the model is that, you know, again, we're not, at least today, right? And it, it might okay, change. Like, you, you do not yeah, have to go. say what's beautiful about this. Like, this is self explanatory. <laughs> okay. You know, like, you're going, you know, the great thing about these uh, Sports Illustrated models, you know, <laughs> is, uh, you know, they're very fit and young and uh, athletic and, uh, you know, they're, they're good at their sports and they're great to look. We're like, we, we're looking at the cover of Sports Illustrated. We understand. <laughs> it's very beautiful. Thank you. No one to stop selling. I get it. And and by the way, for our listeners who are scared right now for their own company, th I just want this isn't this is not real. This is an episode of Black Mirror. It's <laughs> of what could happen in the future? You know, to put you out of business. It's just entertainment. Don't worry. You know, um, um, Yaniv is not going to come and take over your industry tomorrow. It, <laughs> it's going to be three weeks from now. So you have. Yeah. So no. Uh, <laughs> so and tell us about actual brands then, if you can. You know, again, going back to what is what? Well, okay, hold on. Let me ask this. So you leave the computer on overnight, train away. Right. You come in the morning. Bing. Oh, come on, guys! It found it found a, a target market segment that uh, uh, the AI found a five million dollar segment, twenty percent margins, two million dollar investment, four month recoup rate. Five, uh, you know, seven year competitive cycle in which we're one, two, one or two top of market. This is going to be a $30 million win. And you go click on it and it says, uh, you know, uh, laser guided pointers for jihadists you know, or whatever, right? Something that you don't, uh, um, a, a alternative cigarette that has more yeah. nicotine in it. And we can sell it out of Jakarta where they don't have the rule of law, right? Or, I mean, so you must come up with things that are, are either in moral or ethical gray areas or even beyond those gray areas. They don't work for you. But how, So how do you make those judgment calls? Yeah. Right. It's even beyond that, right? Just Let's, let's just be clear, right? Like, you know, machine learning and, and AI and automation, right? They're not a silver bullet that makes everything magically work, right? What they allow you to do is scour through a lot more data a lot faster, but there's still obviously a, a human element that has to look at it. As you mentioned, right? Maybe it's coming back with something that's illegal to sell, and or or it's the one the fact that people are searching for it doesn't necessarily mean you can sell it. Or sometimes it often happens that we see an opportunity and it says, look, if you can make a product like this with these features that doesn't have these flaws at this price point, you can turn it into a multi-million dollar product. And then when you go to the manufacturing, you realize that the reason that doesn't exist it's because it's not possible to today's technology doesn't allow you to do, achieve all the things that the customers want. And therefore you might just not do that. Right? So, so it's not like every time our systems show us something, it's going to work. There's still a lot more work that has to happen beyond that, but just the ability to go and find a needle in a haystack. I mean, there's hundred plus million products available to consumers online at any point in time and more products being added every day. The ability to surface up the opportunity and quickly qualify them and turn them into is this possible or not is already a huge leap forward versus like, I want to make this because I'm passionate about it. Doesn't matter that there's a million people already doing it and I have nothing to offer, right? That's how most companies think today. And that's why a lot of companies yeah. fail, right? Just the fact that we can pull the needle from the haystack, showing us how we can make an iteratively better product and at least putting us in the right direction of what to look for is already a huge, huge, uh, uh, you know, shortcut in, into this, in this business, right? And Hopefully this, is that makes why, sense. this is why when you go to Mohawk brands, uh, 3d printed liver, the buy it now button is grayed out and it says, you know, available, uh, 2048 <laughs> coming soon. 3D That's printed definitely liver. black mirror level. Yeah. <laughs> So, okay, tell tell me about a couple brands uh, that that are actually out there, and I could go buy something today, so I can I can look at it. Sure, 
you know, one of our one of our biggest brands on the appliance uh, category is a, is a brand called Home Labs. Uh, if you just type Home Labs just in one word uh, on Amazon, you'll see a lot of our products. Uh, many different air related appliances, so air purifiers, humidifiers, dehumidifiers, portable ACs, window ACs. Uh, there's many more of them, right? Um, that particular category was interesting to us because uh, one of the things that happened is over time, as we get more and more comfortable with our model, we started looking at bigger and bigger segments where the price tag is much higher. So, you know, if you realize that you can find a way to sell 100 hairbrushes a day for $30, well, why couldn't you sell 100 fridges a day for $200, right? And so yeah. as we went up the value chain and explored that category, we realized in the data a few things. First, those are the, some of the fastest growing categories because most of us as consumers, until not too long ago, we would never buy a fridge online or a air conditioner online. We would have to go to the store and see it. We just didn't feel comfortable around it. So those are categories that are more nascent in e-commerce and growing faster than the ones that are before. Second, there's less competitors, right? And there's a, anyone can go and start a makeup brand or a beauty brand on Amazon, uh, you know, because obviously the cost of goods are not that expensive. And I mean try to put on a balance sheet a bunch of fridges, it's gonna become pretty heavy, right? Uh, and, and third, the companies that do compete in that space, the appliance companies that we grew up on are some of the least sophisticated in, in terms of digital marketing. So when you think about all these things together, it was, a, it was an area that at a macro level from a data perspective definitely interested us and we were able to get some pretty significant success there uh, over time. Uh, again, every product has its own story, right? Uh, you, know, uh, you know, beverage refrigerators, that was a category that we identified a few years ago by again going through all the data and realizing that the existing incumbent was suffering from declining customer satisfaction for a bunch of different reasons we were able to basically make a product that's iteratively better solve some of the issues uh and deliver by just delivering a product that was 20 percent better than the incumbent we were able to take actually pretty much the entire market share that they were holding right so that's the kind of wins we're looking for right iterative uh, improvements to products where we can take market share by just listening to the customer and making a better product. What's a product you, you know, like the least, like wish you didn't have it, but because it's the computer said to do it and the, you know, you guys voted it in and you did it, but it's sort of, you wish it wasn't on your resume. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, I mean, you know, look, every product, every product has a need and, and, okay. and, you know, but, uh, I guess I guess you know the one the one thing that uh, you know we don't mention a lot is we acquired a small company that is one of the leading companies with uh, that that provides an enema kit, which is yeah, maybe would, not uh, the one that I put my name uh, up front every time that I talk about our products. But well, yeah, I mean, yeah, Neves enemas. Let me see. Oh, here, <laughs> photo too. You know, this is good. This is good quality photography. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> Well, thank you for having the courage uh, to to spill yeah, the you know. on that one. Um, and and so, how big? How fast? Tell us about Mohawk. Like, get. Be, be, sure. I can see it's not your nature, and you've been very good. But be promotional for a minute. Tell us. Yeah. Mohawk. I appreciate it. Yeah. So you know we're we're a public company. We're trading on the Nasdaq, right? So uh, you know we have guidance out there. Uh, you know, our, our guidance to the market is that we're going to do north of $300 million in revenue uh, this year and uh, profitable at the uh, adjusted EBITDA level. Um, and, and so, you know, we're we're growing very quickly. Recently, one of the things that has been happening in our industry is, you know, we started in the first six years growing organically through launching a lot of products and brands. And recently, there's been an incredible movement of consolidation happening in the industry where a lot of uh, other companies have raised significant amount of capital to go and buy and, and aggregate and consolidate some of the smaller digital native brands that were created in the last 10 years. And so that's something that's been interesting for us for a while. And, and now the market is very, very uh, excited about that opportunity. And so obviously, we're well set up to capitalize on it. So in the last... Uh, you know, six to eight months, we've, we've done a lot of M&A. We've acquired a lot of like smaller digital native brands that have built amazing products, uh, great, great quality products that have a lot of ratings that are really well positioned to continue to do really well. And we acquired the assets of these companies and basically put them on the platform that we built. And one of the advantages is that we don't, we don't have to take all the fixed costs associated with these businesses because of the infrastructure, the tech, the automation, we can typically pick and choose some of the talent, prove it on board, but most importantly, we just take the assets, the products, and we bring them into our portfolio, right? So that's something we're going to continue to do, and I think that's going to be a very 
exciting part of our growth in the next few uh, few years. Yeah, some brands like Toyota and uh, just some. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the Mohawk brand, you know, here in in a couple years. Uh, let me see if I can turn the corner here. Uh, and, and so you're so data driven, mm -hmm. and analytics is such a critical centerpiece to the business. How do you behave when you get over into deal making world where it is FOMO, fear of missing out, uh, where you've got to weigh, where it's emotional, where you've got to weigh build versus buy, the time yep. value of capital, the time value of people, because deal making just does, that's the world I live in, it just doesn't lend itself to yeah. mathematics, economics, pure, you know, uh, calculus and algebra, there is in some ways deal making is always lose lose because you finish the deal, right? And both of you go, We could have done better now that we have perfect information, you know, right. what the other side uh, is willing to do. So, how does somebody who's like you, um, you know, you came, you came through the IDF? I don't think I'm disclosing national security secrets. <laughs> it was a long time ago. Yeah, uh, you're you know you're in a data driven firm. You live and die on the data. Now you get in a conference room, doing some M and A. What are your driving principles in the M and A or deal making process that you can live by as a data person? That's a that's actually a really great question. And 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 there, you know you're right. If you took a purely mathematical approach to deal making. Uh, you might be in a position where like, you know, you might miss actually one very important element that sometimes I wonder how it can be modeled mathematically as well, which is momentum, right? Like there is, you know, th there is an element of understanding, you know, what momentum does to your capacity to continue to create deals, right? And so, you know, there's, 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 there are thresholds that of course you can never cross. You don't, you, you cannot make bad deals. That's just not acceptable. Uh, and, and, you know, um, you need to just absolutely be certain that that does not happen because it can rule your entire, your, your momentum can also be ruined by making a bad deal just to, to for the purpose to make another deal and continue to create traction. Right. <clears throat> On the other hand, you know, if you go and try to be absolutely perfect with every deal and get the best possible deal, you might miss on, on, on opportunities yeah. because you were penny wise, found foolish, and you thought the valuation should have been. 3.5x and not 3.7x the uh, trailing 12 month EBITDA and just doesn't meet exactly your calculation, right? So somewhere between those two. Let me contextualize those two points because you're mm -hmm. a very experienced deal maker and you're just blowing by like a million topics. <laughs> so sure. I just want to pump the brakes here a little bit. Uh, from, uh, um, from, um, from the sense of um, trying to optimize a deal, my experience is, and I want to see if you agree, you can fatigue the deal or the participants or the seller. Absolutely. Right? And so the more you're in a deal, because this happens to me all the time, where you know we've agreed on a price and it really, the, the adjustments really don't matter. That's why you, when you see a big real estate deal announced, it's $200 million. What, mm -hmm. it wasn't 199 million, 500, like somebody didn't care about $500,000. Just right. the party's fatigued and said, fuck it, 200 million, sure. Done. Go on home for a hockey game and dinner. So you can right. fatigue sellers by trying to optimize your position. And I think that's that's something that you have to live with in m and is you, you, you know you can achieve an objective, but reaching that objective numerically or algebraically can put the whole, uh, all the relationships and the whole deal at risk. From a from a momentum standpoint, I think about it just, and I want to see if you agree. Um, I feel like momentum is very tied to counterparty risk. Yeah. Right. So so um, we have to keep the deal moving along, but if the person on the other side, the seller, seems unstable or risky, or they might change the deal, then momentum slows down as we need to learn more about the safety or the reliability oh. of the seller. And then it can just sort of grow. So momentum is finding good counterparties that believe each other is going to perform on the deal, even right. if there are small variations. Because right. I, I, you know, of the 100 deals I've been in, 
you know, I would say half of them, we had to slip documents. Like yeah. it was perfect at closing, but we couldn't layer on more legal, more accounting, you know, more time. And we said, guys, let's close. You're going to close with a little bit of lack security. We're going to close with a little bit too much money. We're going to slip the document, settle it all out over the next 90 days, but at least we keep the momentum moving forward and get a deal closed. Right. Uh, in, imperfectly, but done. So th those are things, when I think of momentum and when I think of um, optimization, I think of counterparty risk and I think of fatiguing the seller. Yeah. And and, and you, you, you're absolutely right on all these. And I think I would add one one part of that that I wanted to convey was that, you know, when you buy an asset or a company or whatever, you, you have a certain plan of what you're going to do with it. You obviously want to grow it. You want to make it perform. And you're constantly looking at the price you paid versus what you're going to be able to do with the asset. Now, you know, you come up from, you, you kind of like calculate everything on an Excel spreadsheet. And you say, well, if I pay 5X and I'm going to get it to here, then it's going to be worth it for me because X, Y, Z, right? Now, let's say, let's say for some reason you can't get that exact multiple you want, but it's a little bit off. Obviously, if it's dramatically off, your calculation is broken. But like, it, it's important to just realize that you just don't know everything. You know, you make some assumptions as to the you know trajectory you're going to have with the what you're going to do with this business, and you typically probably put it somewhere in the middle, right? To not be too conservative and not to be too aggressive. But at the end of the day, if 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 you're just going to let the deal die because it wasn't perfectly aligned with the curve that you created on your Excel spreadsheet, then you know it's that this concept of perfect is the enemy of good, right? You got to acknowledge the fact that you don't have all the data. And it's quite possible that actually you're going to do much better, right? And you might be have been too conservative and vice versa as well, right? But not being penny wise, but foolish, not letting the momentum of the deal completely die because you're at two points from where you need it to be. And, and, and you can maybe negotiate something else to kind of cover for that is, is very important in my opinion. So I think what I hear you saying that in September of 2019, you didn't model as your key assumption COVID. <laughs> exactly. That's a good version of it. I have yeah, a friend. I, not a friend, a guy worked here and he started a company, asked me if you should start it. I said, no, you should not start this crappy business uh, where they are delivering uh, soil enhancement, like, you know, cow shit mm -hmm. to consumers. It just didn't seem like there was, you know, over the internet on a website and they had some videos and they got it working and they were doing a million four and then COVID hit. They're doing $30 million. Oh, yeah. I mean. So, so that that that's part of it, right? Like, yeah, uh, you you can't predict. You don't know. You don't have all the data, right? And and, and black swan events like this can be good or bad, anyway, right? So, it's uh, it's something that you got to think about as you as you again don't lose momentum because it's not perfect. I know I need to let you go, but I want to get your perspective on one other thing. You go into an M and A deal, mm -hmm. uh, and you try and bring market sensibility to an inexperienced seller. So you know what these assets are worth. You know what they trade with. You understand the inherent risk of them. You know that if they leave you, <sighs> what they're going to find out there in the market in terms of lower quality buyers, lots of LOIs, drop deals, wasted time. And you're trying to bring reality to their frame, their mindset. And in essence, you're sort of having to teach them the M&A business in order to do a deal with them. Right. I find that, you know, many times a case. And then somebody comes along, one of their advisors, and they go, ah, we're, we're worth $30 million, right? Mm -hmm. And so how much time do you invest with a counterparty, a seller, to try and help them get into alignment with reality? Or if they have these sort of fantasy they, they, they've been, their mind has been impregnated by an advisor or a... Um, a press release, you know, from another company, or they see, you know, one of their competitors was bought by Amazon for 300 million. They don't really understand why that deal was done or how it was done or what the, you know, they just see the press release. How much time do you invest with someone to try mm -hmm. and adjust them to the actual reality? Of well, actually the, the, the number one thing I do in these situations is I, actually make them do the work and I'm, and I'm just going to turn around and say oh you think that's what you're worth okay well go do the work show me comparables show me you know go go and bring me out the deals that were done where you know that was the case and, and oftentimes what comes back is, is examples that they want to dream that 
they're at, but then you quickly break it down by just looking at the reality, right? And, and you know, in yep. rare now cases, we're maybe they're right, right? But, but Alphabet but, acquired Google. Okay, this was the multiple. Oh, I'm sorry. You're a $2 million flower company. I don't mean to insult you, but you're you're not Airbnb or Google. I just wanted, you know, so we, we see these, these, these faulty, very faulty comparisons, you know, against, you know, the top eight companies in the history of the world, right? Uh, Dropbox, oh, yeah. Airbnb, Facebook, Google, Alphabet, um, and Microsoft. And so false comparisons, uh, you know, we see a lot. So what, what happens when they come in with a fault, they, they come back in with data that you have to tell them that's not actually data. Like how you can't tell a mom her baby's ugly. It's very difficult. Yeah, I mean, I think again, like you, I, my, my perspective is typically I ask them to come back with some examples and comparables that I can look at and, and then we just dissect through them. And if they are still like, you know, insisting that they are comparable to these companies and we're worlds apart, you let it go, right? I mean, I think, I think part of it is also like, where were you in the process? Have they seen other offers from other people? Have they talked to other people? Sometimes, you know, these companies need to go and get you know, reality check with a bunch of other potential acquirers and go through the process and come back and, you know, maybe just ask, you know, for another offer, right? But but at the end of the day, it's very important that you, you know, you're right. You can't change people's mind about their 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 the things they love. And and typically entrepreneurs have put they pour their love into something. They think it's worth something. You have to respect that, right? And say, you know, you have to respect it and you have to tell them like that. I, I agree. I mean it's fine. Like just please help me go do the work that I can look at this from your perspective, show me why you're comparable to these deals and why you're the same at these companies. Let's go through that together. If we still disagree, if we had a, a, a meaningful conversation, you showed me out of data and we you believe that you're comparable and I don't, then you know let's part ways, go get some other offers. If you still think that it's worth talking to us, come back. But you just, you just, you're just gonna lose your mind if you try to run after someone who is convinced that it's worth something that you don't, right? So if logic doesn't work, maybe time does. And if it doesn't, you just got to know how to let go. So uh, I got to let you go. I want to drop an Easter egg in case we talk again. Just other one quick question. How concerned are you that if you write an offer that, that, that you know you're writing an anchoring offer that is then going to get shopped, you know, and you're sort of negotiating against yourself by delivering an offer? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we typically... We typically only provide an LOI with an exclusivity clause, and and then we just make it pretty short lived, right? Like you, you know, here's here's the offer. Please sign it. You got this amount of time. Otherwise, again, you know, you gotta be able you gotta be able to walk away from from any offer that you put out there, but you also have to make sure that you secure exclusivity for long enough time to actually finish your due diligence and close the deal. And so, you know, it's uh, part of it is n don't get attached, right? Just like we talked about the products, right? We'll make whatever the product data tells us. We're not falling in love with the product to the point where even if it doesn't make money, we keep insisting to have it because we need to have it. Same thing with deals, right? Yes, it's uh, you can get enamored with a deal, but it's important to be have your self-control. Make sure that you are not enamored for, with it for the wrong reasons and make sure that when you make an offer, you're also ready to let go of it if it doesn't work out. Yeah, fair enough. I don't want the answer to this because I hope maybe we'll talk again and we can get into it because this is a, to me, it's a huge issue. I just want to know if you run into it. You're negotiating with someone in good faith. They're under LOI or not under LOI, but you're investing time and money and effort and you've arrived somewhere. Say a, an acquisition price of say $5 million, right? <clears throat> uh, and, and do you ever do retained equity or you just buy it? Uh, outright, a hundred percent. We typically buy a hundred percent. A hundred percent. Okay, so you so you arrive at a price of a uh, hundred percent uh, purchase and sale agreement in principle. You've negotiated in good faith. You're there. You've invested time and energy, and you've got it in your pipeline and your plan. And they go, "Great, it's a deal." You go, "Great, we worked really hard on this. Congratulations." And they go, "Now I just have to go talk to the board of directors." Right. And, you, and just tell me if it happens to you. Let's not talk about how to solve it. And and you, I'm, it's like, I'm sorry, motherfucker. What did you just say? Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, my dad and my uncle and my brother um, and, uh, you know, our lawyer and our accountant, or, uh, board of directors you know, you've never heard of before. And, you know, these th these two guys have painted themselves as the, having the exclusive ability to make the decision, sign off on the deal and move forward. And then 
poof, out of nowhere, Sasquatch, Loch Ness Monster, Board of Directors, Board of Advisor, wife, cousin, uncle, somebody pops up that you've never heard of before, but they are now the ultimate decision maker. Just does it happen and how often? Yeah, no, that's a must. You got to make sure you talk to the decision maker from the beginning. I mean, what's the cap structure? Who else is involved? Who are the other shareholders? Who's going to finally say yes or no on this? I, something we try to get out of the way as soon as possible, right? It actually hasn't you, happened to us that people lied to us and said, yeah, you're talking to the decision right. maker. We got everyone. I mean, it hasn't right. happened to us. I, I, I hope that it doesn't. And I can imagine how frustrating that can be. At the end of the day, you know, if, if you end up in that situation, right, it's very uh, challenging and obviously, you know, it, it's not great, but but you just don't want to go into a deal where at the end of the day, like you, you, you're going to have a transition period. You're probably going to have a situation where people have to come on board and all that. The deal has to be one where maybe not everyone is happy, but everyone is feeling like that's a deal that they wanted to do, right? And so if you get to that position, try to avoid it by making sure you took out of the way all the decision makers. You know you're talking to someone who, you know, can can – can at least you know you know bring in all the decision makers to sign at the bottom line at the end, right? And if you are not there, then you know make sure you try to convince at the end of the, the process that that it's the right thing for the company. But you can't force it at the end of the day, right? Is it, gotta, is it a horrible sign of integrity when somebody at the last minute introduces decision makers that you've never heard of? Yeah, it is. It is. It's. It's. It's very. Uh, yeah. It's. It's terrible integrity, and it's t especially if you went through the process of asking them to make sure that you met all the decision makers, you had a conversation with them, that were involved in the process. It is not a good thing, and it's something that you should maybe consider twice if you even want to do deal. Because what else have you missed in the diligence if you were not able to get that answer early and to check that box early, right? So it's a big red flag, and uh, you know, again, we. Thankfully, it hasn't happened to us yet, uh, and, and we're going to continue to do a lot of M&A, so maybe it will at some point, but to me, it's a huge red flag, and, and if that happens, you might want to reconsider the entire deal, because if you're under the impression that you are talking to the decision maker, and you have their attention, and you know that you're going into this deal, and the work you're putting is going to result in, in a deal happening, if that, doesn't, if that changes last minute, that's a very big red flag. So there definitely needs to, you know, forget about Serena Williams will teach you tennis, there needs to be, Yaniv will teach you deal-making on Masterclass. This has been fantastic. Uh, I, I really appreciate your insights. People should listen to this through a couple times because there is you know, how to do a deal, how to think about markets you know, today from a data standpoint, you know, how to think about brands. Just this, this is a... a, a mining opportunity for everybody to dial in much tighter on their own business. I learned some things here and it's been fantastic. And I think the, the other thing, if you pull back a little bit, you can see the difference between a public company and a private company, lots of swearing and loud yelling and public company measured tone, very professional answers, thoughtful replies and reasonable considered approach to doing business. Private company, lots of yelling and swearing. So it's a good. I do the yelling and swearing in my mind and just like filter it out. <laughs> well, excellent. Thank you for being uh, with us here today. I hope to get a chance to talk to you again. And we'll, I'll be following. But now that I understand Mohawk, which I'm not sure I did from the website, but you know, it's pretty easy to understand the company. All you need to do is spend an hour with the CEO and it's very straightforward. We're working on improving that. You're, you're making a really good point. There's there's no, some work being done on, on 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 getting that story through the website a little better. Yeah. Well, no, it's it's a complex story. Um, it's no problem. I'll just give your phone number out when we your cell phone out when we publish the interview, and then people can contact you directly, day or night, or just come over to your house or whatever. You know, to sounds, ask you questions. Sounds very scalable. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, hey, I don't I don't like you criticizing my business like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Navy. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. I had a great time. Thanks so much. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Bye.